This video has been made with the purpose of education and awareness of real crimes, and there is no disrespect intended to anyone. This is to help promote truth and justice for anyone who has been a victim of crime. What I'm about to report is what I have researched online, and I will welcome any corrections should they be required. Hello there, little Berry True Crime fans. Zeri Berry here. Great to have you back. This is a very unusual historical case. We're going to go back in time again, like we did with Martin Guerre. We're going to go back to the 1840s and 50s in Belgium. Now, in addition to the normal disclaimer that you see at the very beginning, I want to give another one that I am so sorry if I mispronounce Belgian words and names. I'm going to do my very, very best to get them right. So if I do them wrong, I don't mind being corrected, please do so in the comments below. I hope I do this story justice. It is really, it has been really, really interesting to research because there's not a lot of stuff out there about it. And when I was reading it, I thought two things. I thought, this person was extremely tenacious and this person was extremely stupid. You can draw your own conclusions on that. I've titled the video and the thumbnail, The Count of Death. I thought it was catchy, but I don't actually know a lot about the victim in this case. There's not a lot of information I said about the case itself, let alone the specifics surrounding the victim, but I really do hope I do the story justice, so let's get into it. The Vizard de Bocorne family stretched back centuries in Belgium, and in 1750, the Empress Maria Therese granted the title of Count to the then patriarch of the family, Colonel Louis-Francois Bissart, Lord of Bury and Bulcan, which then passed to his forebears. At the time of this case, the current Count of Bulcan was Hippolyte Bissart de Bulcan, further known as the Count, because his name is a bit difficult to pronounce. His mother was Ida du Chastelier. She was a member of another Belgian noble family. Hippolyte's father was Julien Vizard de Bukum. Julien was also the governor of Java, which is an island in Indonesia. In 1818, Ida and Julien boarded the ship to Java. He was posted out there, and it was during a storm on the seas on the ship that the Count of Death, the subject of this video, Hippolyte, or the Count, he was born on this ship, and he actually spent much of his childhood in Indonesia. Apparently, he was raised with very very, very little discipline, very little principles. He didn't have a lot of support. It was also quoted that he was neglected. Now, what that means in those times, again, I do not know, but he didn't have a stable home life there. His father was extremely busy, but he was so almost wild in his mannerisms and antics that he was actually described as having been nursed by a lioness. That's how out of control he was. While he was still a young boy, his father stepped down as his post as governor of Java, and they returned to Belgium. Julien did actually go to the States, particularly Arkansas, and his son, he believed, actually did spend some time out of there with him until he became the next Count, Vizard de Bucum. The Count took up residence in Belgium in a chateau in a place called Bury, which was called Bitremont. In 1943, he met a lady called Lydie Fourneau, who was the daughter of a very wealthy apothecary. She was one of two children, her brother being a man called Gustav. I don't know whether Gustav was older or younger than her, but in those days, the males inherited before the females. And it used to be that, that way with the royal family. It was only this, this particular ascension of the royal family where the next in line, whether they're male or female, will then inherit, otherwise it goes to the male. So this meant that Liddy was not of noble birth, but her parents were pretty wealthy. Now, it's a common misconception that having a title means you have money. Because the Count, he was not very good at keeping his money. He was very good at spending. He had lots of wild parties. He was very, very frivolous. But he didn't have a lot to his name apart from the chateau. By marrying Liddy, it meant that he actually had an income, an annual income, of 2,400 Belgian francs. Now, to put that into context, at the time, I saw a paper that said that was equivalent to roughly 100 pounds sterling, which is the British currency. And 100 pounds sterling in the 1840s, in today's money, is about 14 and a half grand. Now, by today's standard, that is not a livable wage. 
let alone for a noble person who of course needs his money for all of his lavish expenses. So, the Count and Countess had four children. Their first was a son, I believe his name was pronounced Rolduf, um, but he actually died at birth. The next child was also a son called Robert. He then went on to inherit the next Count's title. After that, they had two daughters, Mathilde and Rosa Eugenie. Robert was born in 1845, and his sisters were born in 1848 and 1849, respectively. The Count's money troubles wasn't just a case of he didn't have enough money. He was in a deficit. He was in debt to people. He had creditors knocking at his door. He had to sell a lot of his smaller properties and he even pawned his wife's jewelry in order to borrow more money or pay off debts that he had. But his debts kept mounting up. This two and a half thousand Belgian francs was not enough. The one thing that the Count could rely on was Liddy inheriting a sizable amount of her father's estate when he passed away. Now, when her father did pass away, it was actually Gustav who got the lion's share. It was around 1850 that this happened, and the Count was absolutely incensed that his wife wasn't getting a nice, sizable portion. Their allowance more than doubled. It went from two and a half thousand Belgian francs to five thousand Belgian francs, which in today's money is about thirty thousand sterling. You know, I, I could live on thirty grand quite easily, but no, 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 not of course if you're a, you know, a very extravagant uh, person who likes your parties and finer things in life. The Count and Countess argued about money all the time. Now I don't know if Lydia ever did this, if she ever said to her brother, look. We need a bit more. Could you hand over maybe a little bit more per annum, or could could we just divide the you know the fortunes and the estates by half? I don't know if that ever actually happened. Liddy though would go on to inherit Gustav's fortune, provided Gustav did not have any legitimate heirs. Now Gustav was unmarried at the time of his father's death, but he he wasn't a well man. He'd always been sickly as a child, and he was described as having been of weak constitution, basically meaning physically weak, susceptible to illnesses, etc. And at one point, he actually had one of his legs amputated, which caused no end of problems, probably an infection, and of course, mobility would be difficult as well. He walked on crutches to help him get around. The Count was relying on his brother-in-law dying before he produced any heirs. And it seemed like, you know, this might one day happen. And the Count even went so far as to speak to a physician to say, you know, when will my brother-in-law die? But apparently um, the physician's answer to him was, well, he's not well, but he's not on his deathbed. You know, he's not, you know, on his way out anytime soon. So. He may not live to a great age, but he's not going anywhere right now. And another blow to the Count was that Gustav announced that after purchasing a property from a very, very poor noble family, he also proposed marriage to the former owner, probably just to keep it in the family. This incensed the Count. Gustav was getting married. He could produce heirs. This was when the Count decided to act. Under an alias, he began to research chemistry, particularly vegetable poisons. And he bought an Alembic, which is basically a chemistry set or an alchemy set from a local uh, maker of Alembics. He also used another alias to correspond with a chemist to learn how to distill the poisons from certain plants. It took months of preparation and learning from scratch, basically, how to extract pure poison from plants. It's not an easy thing to do, and it takes a huge amount of the actual plant to produce even the tiniest amount of the actual, actual active ingredient in the poison. Once he was happy with his concoction, he decided to test it out, and he did so by poisoning some of the cats and the ducks in that area and burying their bodies on the land. The poison he had produced, which I will reveal later, gave the victim a very painful but pretty quick death. It would cause sort of a burning of the mouth and the throat and they would pass away within seconds. Once he was happy with this, 
He then decided to put the assimilation into effect. The Count invited his brother-in-law to his chateau on the 20th of November 1850. This was under the pretense of him signing documents to become a trustee of the Count and Countess's estate because apparently they were going to go to Germany for quite some time or even to live. That was actually not going to happen. The three children unusually were actually ordered to have their dinner in the kitchen. That was very unusual because normally the family would dine together in the family dining room. That had never been asked of them, even if they were entertaining guests. And another thing that was unusual was rather than the servants doing the serving of the food, the Countess did this herself. Not long after dinner was served, the Countess then ordered everybody out of the dining room. She locked the door and behind the door in the kitchen, a maid, whose name I believe was Emerance, heard a scream and a thud and a commotion and a, and a kerfuffle coming from the dining room. And she could have sworn she heard Gustav screaming his brother-in-law's name. Emerance hurried to the dining room. The Countess actually burst out of there herself and the two women were face to face. Liddy then went to get some hot water and called out to the maid and the coachman that her brother was lying on the floor, dead, apparently from a stroke. The Count then ordered bottle after bottle of vinegar and he poured this down the throat of his dead brother-in-law. He then ordered the coachman and the maid to strip Gustav's body and scrub him clean with more vinegar. The Countess took her brother's clothes and washed them and the coachman was tasked with taking Gustav's body to the maid's bedroom and laying it on the bed. Emerance would actually later recall that when she went into the dining room after this all happened, the floor looked stained and marked in a way that hadn't been before. And it wasn't just, you know, knocks and marks from things falling. It was, it was as if liquid had burned the floor. She'd also noticed that Gustav's face looked scratched and cut. There seemed to be a lot of saliva pouring down the sides of his mouth. And in the trail of saliva appeared to be blisters. The Count and Countess did not sleep at all that night. Liddy spent the whole night scrubbing and scrubbing the dining room floor and her husband actually ended up scraping the dining room floorboards with a knife. Liddy also tried to clean her brother's crutches but either because it was in vain or you know he's not going to need them now she decided to burn them. The servants of the household got together. They were extremely distraught at what happened Someone had died in the house and it didn't matter how much the Count and Countess said he had a stroke, which in those days was called apoplexy. They weren't stupid. They could see that Gustav's face was injured. His mouth was burnt. They decided to consult a local cleric and somehow or other rumors had got around to the local examining magistrate that Gustave Fournier was at the Chateau de Bittremont and he had suffered what was called an unnatural death. The magistrate wasn't convinced, but he knew he had to follow it up. You know, there was a dead body there and it had to be, you know, given a certification of death. Everything had to be checked out. And normally, if the magistrate did that, he would turn up with physicians and military personnel. But he was so skeptical that he didn't bother with the military personnel. He just turned up with three physicians and a town clerk. At first, the Count actually wanted to turn the magistrate away. He didn't want anything to do with him. In a way, he had a legal obligation to allow the magistrate in because you can't conceal a dead body without allowing the dead person to receive their certification of death and also for this to be investigated if it's a bit suspicious. So the magistrate was allowed in and showed to the room but the curtains in the room were closed. The whole place was dark, so the magistrate couldn't actually see Gustav very well. And he asked Liddy to pull the curtains and for some reason she refused. So the magistrate decided to do so himself. And when he did and the room was lit up, he saw that the Count had his hands over his brother-in-law's face. He was shielding his face from the magistrate clearly he had something to hide. And as much as the Count wanted to shield his brother-in-law's face from the magistrate, it was in vain. The magistrate saw everything he needed to, to know that this was not normal. He saw the black and burnt mouth of the dead man. He saw the massive cut down his face and the scratches. And he also saw that underneath 
one of the Count's fingernails, there was a clear sign of blood or some something that was there. So the magistrate ordered the body to be taken to the coach house and the physicians examined it. The magistrate also had the Count's fingernails scraped. He was convinced that the scratch down Gustav's face, and there were smaller scratches, but the one massive scratch was caused by the Count. The physicians took two hours to complete their autopsy. When they delivered the results to the magistrate, they revealed that everything right from the mouth all the way to the stomach had been burned with a very corrosive substance. And the first thing they suspected was acid. How on earth did the Count and Countess think that burns would explain a stroke or if a stroke would explain burns? The magistrate ordered the arrest of the Count and Countess and also the dissection of Gustav's body so that the organs would be preserved in alcohol in individual vats so that they could be sent for testing. The magistrate actually personally took Gustav's body parts to Brussels, and he specifically wanted a particular chemist to look at them. His name was Jean Star, and he's very, very famous. And this particular case was one of the cases that propelled him into prominence in the world of science. Jean Star was the top chemist in Belgium. Now, when he was given the body parts and he took them out of the alcohol and he had a look at them, he was able to confirm that the burns on the, you know, the tongue and the esophagus, they weren't caused by acid. He used the, his sense of smell to determine as to what was causing this. And acid has a specific smell, but this one, mm -mm, no, it was an acid. He did sense the presence of vinegar though. Now vinegar is acidic, but vinegar has a very specific smell. Jean Star was already really familiar with a wide range of vegetable poisons. He knew what to look for. Jean Star used a number of tests to determine the compounds that were present in this particular poison. And he was able to identify a particular scent called conine. Now, if you're a fan of Agatha Christie, you will know that if you've ever read uh, the Five Little Pigs novel or seen the television adaptation, that conine was actually used in this particular case and it was extremely fast acting. It's a poison found in plants like the hemlock, that is the, you know, the most common one that we know of, otherwise known as false parsley because hemlock does look like parsley and also the yellow pitcher plant. He conducted more and more tests, which I'll get into, into in a minute because I don't understand all of it, but he was then able to determine that the cause of the conine, the cause of the compound, was tobacco. Most of us know the smell of tobacco and most of us know that the active ingredient in tobacco is nicotine. Jean Star was able to determine that Gustave was poisoned by pure nicotine. So nicotine had been isolated from tobacco so that it was in its purest form. And nicotine in its pure form is lethal. It's extremely corrosive, very, very poisonous. And yes, it's in cigarettes and cigars, but it's a very, very different thing if it's in its pure form and if it's swallowed or injected. Jean Star told the magistrate of his conclusions and a search of the chateau found the washroom where the Count had his chemistry set loads and loads of tobacco plants and files of pure nicotine were found. The servants were interviewed and quite a lot of them thought that he was brewing eau de cologne. The chemistry set, the Alembic, had actually been concealed in a hidden space behind some boards at the property. That was taken away for testing. Also some clothes that the gardener was wearing when he was you know, taking hold of all the tobacco plants, that tested positive for pure nicotine too. The floorboards of the dining room were scraped and the scrapings were taken for testing, show pure nicotine. It is a value to know exactly what tests Jean Star did in order to determine the nicotine. Now you can skip forward if you don't want to hear this now, it's a little bit complicated, but basically this was a groundbreaking experiment and it's an experiment which laid the foundation to determine the presence of vegetable poisons in human tissue. It's a test that is still used today. And I'm gonna to do my best to explain it. Acids and alkalines are opposites on the pH scale. Jean Star was able to successfully show the presence of alkaloids in vegetable poisons 
That means vegetable poisons are all alkaline. They are also soluble in water and alcohol. The idea was to separate the soluble and insoluble parts. So if you've got insoluble body parts with soluble poison, then you can use a solvent such as water to extract that from the insoluble body part, if that makes sense. Basically what he would do is he would take the body part, he would basically puree it, not a nice thing to think about, and then mix it with alcohol and acid. And then water is added, which filters out the poison from the solid body parts. This breakthrough was actually happenstance because the circumstances in this murder were such that the body parts had been preserved in alcohol, and what substance had the Count administered to Gustav after he had died? Vinegar, which is an acid. So alcohol and acid combined together was able to produce this substrate, I suppose, to which water and I think it was other bits and pieces can be administered in order to filter out the specific poison from the insoluble body parts. Further searches of the chateau also showed the correspondence and the aliases that the Count had used. The evidence against the Count and his wife was damning, more so for him than for her. Now when these two were arrested, they turned on one another basically. The evidence put forward shows the Count's long-term campaign to get rid of his brother-in-law, the motive was there, the substance was there. The employees of the property also broke ranks and testified against their employers, saying that the behavior there was very, very strange. Not just the Count, but also his wife. It was long, long thought that both of them were in collusion, that Liddy was more than happy for her brother to be killed so she would inherit. Now that's not the first time that this thing happens where siblings kill one another to inherit. The Count's version was this, that yes, he had been distilling nicotine, but it wasn't for, you know, it wasn't to kill his brother-in-law, but he happened to have some files of nicotine on the dining table at the time. His wife mistook them for wine and poured it into his brother's, his brother-in-law's glass and he drank it and accidentally died. And this scuffle was when he panicked after, you know, getting the corrosive burn and everything. Yeah, that, that didn't hold water, the jury wasn't buying it. The Countess's version was that, yes, she knew what was going to happen, but she'd been coerced by her husband into compliance. She had not actually been in the dining room when the poison was administered to Gustav. The difficulty there was that the prosecution was able to determine that it, or even someone who is physically weak, like Gustav was, poor man, he would have needed someone to restrain him while this corrosive liquid was poured down his throat. And the injuries on him was consistent with somebody pitting him down or pushing him to the floor or tackling him. It was determined that the Count had restrained his brother-in-law while his wife actually administered the poison, yet he was saying it was accidental, she was saying she wasn't there. So personally, I think they were both lying. But the jury believed the wife, they didn't believe the husband. The trial took 17 days, the jury only took an hour and a half to find the Count guilty of the murder of Gustave Fournier, his brother-in-law. His wife was acquitted. Reports of the trial show that when the not guilty verdict was administered to the Countess, the Count actually looked relieved. She had no expression at all. And when his guilty verdict was read, he looked shocked, but his wife had no reaction. She turned around and walked out. The Count then exclaimed his innocence before leaving the court, and he was sentenced to death by guillotine. Very, very famously, he made a specific request that the blade of the guillotine be extra sharp. And he, he said the reason for this, was that he had read in, you know, newsletters that some executions by guillotine had not been successful on the first strike, that it had taken about three, sometimes four strikes for the person to be fully decapitated. And he said that the idea of that made him shudder. So his request was carried out. The blade of the guillotine was extra sharp. And on the 19th of July, 1851, he was executed by guillotine, which took only one strike. As for the Countess, it was speculated at the time, and it has been since, 
that she was acquitted purely because she was a woman. Nobody could conceive that she would be capable of killing her own brother, but also being a woman, being a, the weaker sex, she'd be easily coerced by her husband. She would be powerless to stop him doing something that he wanted. I'm sorry, no. This man was her brother. They grew up together. I don't care if it meant breaking ranks against her husband. She should not have been compliant in this. I do think that she had a part in this. Another thing to take into consideration is that if they had convicted her and if she had been executed, those three children, bear in mind the youngest was only two, they would have been orphans. They may well have been raised by, you know, other relatives, but goodness knows what would have happened to them. Another account I've read said that Liddy was acquitted because they couldn't face sending a woman to her death, to the guillotine. I'm against the death penalty completely. I don't believe that, you know, a wrong makes a right, or like two wrongs make a right. I don't believe in that whatsoever. And just because somebody has killed someone doesn't necessarily mean that killing them puts that, that ro right wrong, you know. Death, to me, isn't punishment. It's a way out. Life in prison, is a lot better because it means that they don't have the liberty and their control as much as they want to because a lot of psychopaths they love to have control in this case if liddy had died the children would have been orphans and that would have been awful but at the same time i do think she should have answered for her you know for what happened and if this had happened in this day and age if a husband and wife are convicted of killing someone they'd be sent to prison the children would be put in care or, you know, sent to live with relatives. And Liddy, let's not forget, she would have gone on to inherit her brother's wealth. She would have been a wealthy woman. She'd have been a single mother, but she would have been wealthy. Not quite sure what happened to her afterwards, but Robert, their son, he went on to become the next count. And he had a son called Henry, or Henri, I think his name would be pronounced. Chateau de Bicamont is in ruins basically now. It's, it's abandoned. One other reason why I think that the count looked relieved when his wife was acquitted, maybe because he knew that he probably wouldn't be, or he was glad that their children would not be without their mother, at least. This this case baffles me, like, there are way simpler and less time consuming and not, not to mention, you know, purchasing an Alembic and tobacco and all of this would have cost the Count money, which he apparently didn't have. Why go to all these lengths? And also it is very clear, especially from the fact that he tested these on poor animals. I mean, the animals were, their bodies were actually examined and that's how they also determined that they were poisoned with nicotine too. He, sh he should have known that it, that it leaves burns in the mouth and those burns cannot be explained by a stroke. And surely he could have picked a more, a, sort of a better time to do this when there wouldn't be witnesses such as the maid or, you know, and the coachman. This seems like not only a act of malice and greed, this, this man did nothing wrong other than just be born a male who was entitled to a property. He just wanted to live his life. The poor man had really bad health. He deserved to get married. He deserved to have a life and it was stolen from him. The Count was greedy. He thought he was so clever that he, oh, I can distill nicotine and I can use that. Just because you found uh, an ingenious method to commit murder doesn't mean that you are a murderous genius. Genius. So that's it for this week's true crime, a bit of a history lesson too, and I hope you find it interesting. Um, as ever, like, comment, share, subscribe, all of that. In that corner, I think it's down that way, or is it the other? No, that, yeah, that, that side there. There should be a watermark, and if you hover above that, and then a subscribe shut button should be there click it. It will be great if you could. Thank you. I already have my cases for the rest of 2022 planned out, um, but if you do want me to cover anything specific or particular, I may consider doing extras or add them into my next year's rota. But thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a great day or a great evening, great life, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye.